Thank you for, uh, uh, thank you everybody. I'm sorry for the uh, few moment delay. Uh, and um, in the uh, absence of uh, Commissioner Chang, I've been asked to, uh, Chung, I've been asked to uh, chair uh, this afternoon's meeting. So we'll uh, proceed with calling the roll, please. Sure, Commissioner Chow. Present. And Commissioner Guillermo. Present. Great, I will read the land acknowledgement. Thank you. The San Francisco Health Commission acknowledges that we are on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramatosho Ohlone, who were the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. As the indigenous stewards of this land and in accordance with their traditions, the Ramatosho Ohlone have never ceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as the caretakers of this place, as well as for, as well as for all peoples who reside in their traditional territory. As guests, we recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. We wish to pay our respects by acknowledging the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramatush Ohlone community and by affirming their sovereign rights as First Peoples. The second item on the agenda is the, um, are the minutes of the June 6, 2023 meeting. Uh, so the minutes are before us. Uh, we need a motion for acceptance. A move approval. And I would second uh, all those. Uh, oh, we have to ask for public testimony. There's no one on the, on the line at this time, so there's no need to ask for public comment. Okay, so we'll uh, proceed to the vote if there is no uh, corrections. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, aye. thank you. Okay. Uh, we can move on to item three, the monthly contracts report. Thank you. Good afternoon, commissioners. Move this up a little bit. There, is that working? Great, thank you. There we go. Okay, we have um, eight items in the monthly uh, report this month. Uh, the first item is a contract with Haluna Health with the Population Health Division for their COVID response. Uh, the requested action is approval of a contract amendment with Haluna Health to increase the total contract amount with contingency to an amount of 5,528,789 and to extend the current contract term from January 1, 21 to 7, 31, 23, uh, currently two years and seven months um, to three years and six months from January 1, 21 through 6, 30, 24. The Health Commission previously approved this contract on September 7th, 2021. Haluna Health provides program administration and support services for the DPH uh, population Health Division uh, for the COVID response to support a broad range of COVID-19 testing and surveillance related activities. Of the proposed annual funding in the amount of 3639534 Haluna Health will receive a 12.1% administrative fee of 392848 with the remaining balance of 3246686 going towards programmatic cost. The proposed amendment exercises the options authorized under Administrative Chapter 2142 authority Funding will continue to provide uh, to provide support under program administration modality. Um, the department is requesting approval um, in this amount uh, or an increase in, in the amount of 5,528,769 or an increase of 19,569 due to the following changes. As noted in the monthly report, there are reductions of unspent funds in the following four areas. 42,231 of CDPH uh, ELC or epidemiology and laboratory capacity. Um, enhancing detection of state funds for fiscal year 2021 in the amount of $306,104. Uh, 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 and in the CDPH ELC enhancing detection expansion state funds for fiscal year 21 22 in the amount of $391,199. Um, and in CDHP ELC enhancing detection of state funds in 22. Uh, uh, as well, and another reduction in the amount of $90,000 of general fund for fiscal year 22-23. Um, then a carry forward amount of 433,430 of unspent funds, a carry forward amount of 306,104 of unspent funds for fiscal year 2022, um, and an increase in the amount of $90,000 to the 12% contingency valued. Um, uh, the, the current contingency will be 507,547, previously 417,547. Uh, please note the annual funding level increases the following amounts in terms, uh, $2,900,000 in the CDPH ELC enhancing detection expansion state funds uh, for the two year term of 7122 through 63024, um, 433,430,000 of carry forward 
in CDPH ELC enhancing detection state funds for the term of November 18th, 22 through 6 24 for one year and seven months, um, and of $306,104 unspent uh, CDPEH uh, ELC funds uh, for one year of 7122 through 6320, I'm sorry, 7123 through 6324. The annual funding level increased by 559,532 due to the following changes a decrease in the general fund in the amount of 180,000. A carry forward um, amount of 433,430 and a carry forward amount of 306,104. Um, the carry forward amounts um, uh, were due to staff vacancies. Um, we received a question earlier today how do we know the services provided by Helena Health were satisfactory? Um, the response in the monitor in the monthly report um, was, was provided a mistake by BOCC. It's, it's, it was a summary that they do not monitor these uh, programs that are. Um, that we refer to as program administration. Um, these are very specific incidents to perform very specific functions, such as to manage professional consultants, issue solicitations for community-based vendor or other very specific categories. Um, in preparation of program administration contracts, there is a primary solicitation or a mini RFP to select from an approved list of vendors um, in that solicitation. Both the role of the program administration and the objectives of services are identified in the contract. Um, the information um, uh, regarding the objectives um, is, uh, for the program administration uh, services are conducted by the systems of care holding the contract. Um, they are monitored lifetime by the business owner who meets regularly with the, uh, with the vendor to make sure that the objectives are being met. Um, BOCC monitoring occurs after the close of the fiscal year and that would be too late to ensure that the project was moving forward as it should. Um, additionally, I have some further comments from the PhD system of care uh, in this response um, that they are, uh, that the, the, the monitoring is conducted by the system of care due to the funding requirements from the grantor. PhD is able to assure that Helena Health Services are satisfactory as a system of care reports to the funder uh, on the status of milestones in progress that the Haluna Health contract supports, including hiring of contract staff and activities of subcontractors. As deliverables are met in the work plan, this is reported to the funder. If grant deliverables are not met, PhD is unable to provide justif justification that milestones have been reached, uh, then PhD is not able to bill the funder for the reimbursement or is at risk of not being refunded. Monitoring is done lifetime as we can, uh, or real time as uh, we shared earlier through regular meetings between the DPH system, uh, the section of care and the program administration contract to ensure that they are on track with administrative processes and timelines such as subcontractor agreements, oversight and payments and also that goods and services are in alignment with public health goals of the contract. Um, this is done uh, for example with regular monthly meetings between the SOC and Eluna Health as I discuss the contract as they move forward in real time. Good. Uh, is there any public still on? The There's no one online on? right now. <clears throat> okay. Uh, commissioners, question. Commissioner. Uh, yeah. Just one question. Could you remind us how long has Haluna Health been the uh, this uh, administrator for these programs? For this this first uh, item is with uh, PhD, and I think that's mm -hmm. a fairly new contractor. Um, we have uh, Nancy Yu, who's the ELC program manager, and Eddie Sita, who's the acting policy branch director for PhD, who are attending virtually, who could probably give you a more precise answer to that question, if one of them could ch chime in. Could one of you all um, unmute yourselves and respond to Commissioner Guillermo? I see Nancy on there. Oh, who else was it, Dean? Eddie Sita. Yes, um, Eduardo or Nancy, there we go. Hello commissioners, can, can you hear me? This is Eduardo Sida. Yes, hi. Um, so the Linda Health has been administrating some of the LC contracts since its inception back in 2019. Um, and they continue to do so and advocate for extensions. And so it was extended up to July uh, 2024 of next calendar year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie. Any other question, uh, Commissioner? 
No, on thank that. you. Um, so I want to thank Mr. Goodwin for getting the information in regards to how uh, you actually uh, do follow, because it's a, uh, a real-time thing, right? If, if, if they are behind, then you would have gotten complaints. And uh, so, so uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, though, it, it suddenly struck me, you know, the number of programs uh, for COVID have been declining. And yet, this one goes up by about over half a million, uh, half a, yeah, half a million dollars. Um, so, um, if in fact there are less services, so if this is by service rendered, and then that's what the payment is for. In 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 terms of even the fixed administrative costs, I, I mean, if if people aren't doing a certain amount of education or uh, whatever, and I know Helena Health was helping to administer even the uh, uh, administration, right, of vaccines and all in the past, and that will, you know, probably relate to the next contract also question-wise. Uh, is this a, as you perform the services, then they're paid to the subcontractor and then Helena Health collects its percentage, or is its percentage fixed? regardless of whether services are rendered? That's a really good question. You know, I, the, the bulk of this contract is paying for um, consultant staff who work within the system of care to help support the services. I believe if uh, Eddie or Nancy could um, more thoroughly respond to Dr. Chow's question about um, ongoing services and if those are um, staying at the same level or changing over time. Hello, this is uh, Eddie again. Um, so the, the level of services has been uh, waiting since 2019 as we continue to transition the COVID task force into the population health division. Um, and so as we continue that transition, the, some of the consultant and contracting staff have been downgraded in numbers. Um, and so the care report kind of helps support the, continue, the continuation of these services as we continue to transition. Uh, but the I believe the question about the top Point five percent is a fixed cost for the for the contract agreement. Uh, okay, so even if we don't expend it all because not all the services are rendered, they still get the uh, three hundred ninety three thousand dollars. Is that regarding the top point five percent? Well, that was the administrative fee. So I'm just wondering if the administrative fee is tied to the services or that's just a flat fee paid for it's, that. It's a flat fee that's tied to the percent of the um, total dollar amount that's invoiced for that period. So oh, that's invoiced. So percent of what okay, they spend. Okay, so it is related to whether or not services have I, been. I believe so. That's part of their indirect rate, I believe. Okay. Um, all right, well, that makes sense. Um, yeah. and, and that was why I was kind of asking, because if otherwise no services were rendered and this was a fixed cost, then um, that would be, I think, another question. I believe that's correct. Eddie, this 12.1% this 12, 12 administrative, that's more of an indirect rate than a flat fee that they get entirely correct. Yeah, so each month they, they bill, and so it bills to the services they provided. Yeah. Okay, no, that's fine. I mean, that's appropriate, and as you say, as transition occurs, you know, we're really expecting, that's why you also probably have a number of excesses that you're rolling over, right. uh, because uh, there has been a decline in the number of COVID uh, uh, services offered and, and uh, even uh, administration, right? So that's... That's we good. have it there um, just in case. Right, well, while you're on the line, and to answer, I think Commissioner Guillermo's question also, um, by extension, we've been dealing with um, Haluna Health and its previous name, PHFE, yeah. uh, for how many years? A very long time, more than Well, that's 20. what I'm thinking. But uh, I mean, uh, to give her a perspective that is this, you know, uh, um, somebody that have been working with, I, I remember the name for some time, but is this a decade or two decades or, you know, it's not a two year Type yeah, new newly formed I mean, organization. Yeah. It's the I would say over 20 years. For, uh, I I will, but I will confirm and okay. I will tell you when the first contract with PHFE started and send that to you through Mark. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we've been using them a long time, and so I I, I think that was just trying to clarify the uh, term of the contract. 
Uh, certainly the services uh, are not in question. Uh, so can we go on to the next contract then? Yep, absolutely. The next contract is with uh, Maitree AIDS Hospice. Uh, requested action is approval of a contract amendment with Maitree uh, to reflect a total contract amount with contingency of 14130444 The term of this contract will be amended um, to reflect um, a new term of, of January, July 1, 2017 through March 31st, 2027 total of nine years and nine months, extending the current term by three years. The contract provides hospice services for people living with HIV and AIDS as, uh, and in need of 24-hour residential care uh, facility for chronically impaired residents of San Francisco. The Health Commission previously approved the current contract amount um, and term on August 4th of 2020. The proposed amount exercises options authorized under RFP 25-2017. Additional funding will continue to provide support under the hospice services modality. Um, this proposed amendment is subject to approval by the San Francisco Board of Supervisors where it will um, uh, be, be uh, heard in the near future. Uh, we're requesting amount of the total um, contract amount with contingency as stated of 14134444 an increase of 4594103 due to the following changes. A reduction of total unspent funds uh, from uh, SAM, the State Office of AIDS funding, or also the Ryan White Part B funding, um, and general fund in the amount of 65545 uh, from fiscal years 17, 18, 18, 19, and 1920. An increase in Ryan White Part A funding of 1,887,786 uh, for fiscal year 24, 25 through uh, 26, 27, um, uh, which comes out to 629,262 annually. An increase to the SAM or single allocation model state office of AIDS funding um, for Ryan White Part B dollars in the amount of 2,256,159 for fiscal year 24, uh, 25 through fiscal year 26, 27, uh, which comes out to $752,053 annually. Also, an additional amount of $515,703 um, to be added to the 12% contingency value uh, applied uh, from fiscal year 23, 24 through. 2627. Um, the previous contingency amount was 147,328, and the new amount will be 663,031. 31 um, uh, Note the annual funding level remains the same. There's no changing to the no changes to the annual funding for the programmatic funds. If you have any questions, Beth Neary, the um, Assistant Director of HIV Health Services, is attending virtually to respond to any questions that you may have for this contract. Thank you. We still have no public. Uh, yes, and even if we were uh, did a public comment, um, it's only at the end of the whole contract report that we take public comment. So you all can go ahead and ask all your questions, and then I will make sure I remind you. Oh, great. Okay, thank you. Oh, yeah, for the contract as as a single. Uh, right. Uh, okay. Uh, it, it might be that. Uh, well, I, I guess it's okay. But if we were taking public comment, I, I'm just asking you to think of this now. Uh, whether to have it ahead of time if we're going to have only on the contract because then we could hear what the public said about certain contracts or you're saying that we should do it at the end before a vote we take public comment this is one item so even though it has multiple contracts it's one item so we take public comment once at the end of the presentation of the whole item okay. so you me. all yes and unfortunately i hear you so you're unfortunately not able to respond to the comment as you're doing it but you also could, could uh, after the public comment right. you could and also you come back and, and make change yes. okay no that's fine just want to be sure that we are able to uh, take into account public uh, um, you know comment on that uh, okay uh, commissioner any questions on none for me okay and and I thought uh, this one uh, uh, if, um, if if staff could just uh, tell us uh, I know this has been a very long time program and one that has been really very effective and I remember when it first started so do we know how long it's been I know I didn't write that down but uh, realizing Commissioner Carroll might like the background that you know as to uh, whether you know it's it, it's something like over 10 years I think uh, oh, I, I, uh, when I worked in the AIDS office in the 90s, my tree was there. So it's yeah. been yeah, it's been like very close to 30 years, if not yeah. 30 years. Yeah. yeah, very much so. Um, Beth, are you available to respond to Commissioner Chow's question about performance of um, my tree in recent years? Can uh, Can you hear me? Yes. 
Oh, wonderful. Hi, thank you. Uh, hi, commissioners. Uh, I'm Beth Neary, uh, Assistant Director of HIV Health Services. Um, I'm glad that Mark and Dean were there to share the more historical background of how long standing this program has been, um, because I, don't, I wasn't around at the very start of it. But I do know for the for the eight and a half years I've been here, it, it was it was already an incredibly stable program providing for a long time. It was focused fairly exclusively on hospice care. Uh, and now it's expanded to also include um, skilled nursing services. So some people are recovering and um, being able to move move on to other other living situations. So it has pivoted a little as HIV treatment has gotten better, um, but it still provides the same key service for about 10 clients a year under the Ryan White Part A grant. Um, I'm sorry, about 10 clients at a time, 10 beds, um, and closer to 30, 30 clients annually. Um, and in addition, there's a small sliver of Ryan White Part B funding that is, is much newer, around three to five years ago uh, that piece started when there was an expansion of uh, state Ryan White Part B funds available, and that's to provide mental health services in both group and individual therapy uh, programs. First, it was only to residents, and then as more people are moving out of my tree, some of, some of the residents come back to attend group or get a little bit of uh, individual therapy in their transitional uh, time. It's a, that's a very small amount of the funding, uh, but that's the, that's the newer element of the program. Great. Thank you. I thought it's such a, um, I remember when it started, it was really innovative and, and one, must be probably one of the first in the country to do what it was doing uh, at the time. And, and uh, it's really a pleasure to be able to, uh, I think, uh, recommend the continuation of this important service. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Commissioner Chow. We'll go on to the next item. Okay. I mean, the next contract. The next, con the next item is the second Haluna Health contract for strengthening STD prevention and control for the health department. Um, uh, requested action is the approval of a contract amendment um, uh, total amount in, with contingency to reflect 6287182 The contract term will remain the same. The contract provides program administration and support services to the disease prevention and control branch uh, in support of strengthening STD prevention and control for health department or PCHD um, and strengthening syndemic based sexual health care. Um, of the 909 $188,815 in annual funding. Um, Haluna Health receives 12.1% uh, uh, in, um, in indirect fees, we'll, we'll say it that way, for uh, $106,732, with the balance of 882083 going towards the PCHD programmatic cost. Um, the proposed amendment is authorized under RFQ 36-2017. Additional funding will continue to support the efforts to reduce and educate the San Francisco target population about STDs and other communicable diseases. Um, the uh, the uh, total amount, the total contract amount with contingency uh, is an increase of $229,769 due to the following, um, an additional amount of 189,671 from the ending the HIV epidemic component C grant award for fiscal year 23-24 an additional amount of $15,480 from the Strengthening STD Prevention and Control for Health Departments, or PCHD, grant award for one additional month of January 1, 24 through uh, January 31st of 24, and an increase of $24,618 added to the um, uh, contingency value applied for current and future years. Previous contingency was 598444, and the current amount will be 623062. If you have any specific programmatic questions, we have Anthony Taylor, who's the HIV and STI program manager um, from the system of care available. Uh, okay, uh, Commissioner? None, thank you. So, so I was just going to comment. I thought that it was very good that we've now, uh, again, this is a good contract to show the uh, bringing together of HIV and STSs in terms of uh, uh, moving our program. So uh, it's really nice to see that. Thank you. Absolutely. We'll go on to the next item then. Okay. Item number four is with uh, Mission Neighborhood Health Center for the Mission Center of Excellence program. Uh, requested action is approval of a contract amendment with Mission Neighborhood Health to increase the total contract amount with contingency to an amount of 11 million uh, $300,310 and to extend the current contract term from March 1 of 2020 through February 29th of 2024, currently a four-year term, uh, to uh, now end on February 28th, 2030 for a new term of 10 years or an increase of six additional years. 
The Health Commission previously approved this contract on April 21st, 2020. The contract provides center of excellence services to clients engaged in primary care while providing the network of social support services to keep the clients engaged in care and improving viral load suppression um, at the Mission Neighborhood Health Center. The pro proposed amendment exercises um, options authorized under RFP 5-2019. Funding will continue to provide support under the ambulatory outpatient medical care um, and treatment adherence, medical case management, mental health and substance use treatment modalities. The proposed amendment is subject to approval by the San Francisco Board of Supervisors. Um, the uh, requesting approval of the total amount uh, with contingency of 11,300,310 is an increase of $6,624,000. $852 due to the following, a reduction of unspent funds in the amount of 125293 of Ryan White Part A uh, and Ryan White Part A MAI funding for the term of fiscal year 2021, reduction of unspent funds in the amount of 109867 uh, also of Ryan White Part A and Part A MAI funding for fiscal year 21-22, uh, another uh, reduction of unspent funds in the amount of 342,236, again in Part A and Part A MAI for fiscal year 22-23. Um, additional Ryan White funding uh, being added in the amount of 3,793,542, um, or an amount of 632,257 annually for fiscal years 24-25 through 29-30. Um, also additional Ryan White Part A MAI funding in the amount of $2,829,018 or 471,503 annually. Um, for fiscal years 24, 25 through 29, 30, an increase um, in the amount of 579,688 um, to the contingency amount was applied um, for those new fiscal years as well. The current contingency amount is 927,158, an increase from the previous amount of 347,471. Um, and please note the annual funding uh, level remains the same. This is just to extend the term. Um, again, if you have any programmatic questions, we have Beth Neary, Assistant Director of HIV Health Services, to respond. Uh, Commissioner? Yeah, I do. I have uh, a question. It's actually about the monitoring uh, report. Um, and this goes for MITRI as well. The, the, there's a section in the uh, letter that, says, that speaks to reviewing the governance practices. Um, and I'm just sort of wondering if there's, you know, a couple of uh, examples of what the best practices are that are um, being reviewed um, just as, a, as uh, an example or just so that we can get a sense here of the kind of governance uh, things that we're paying attention to. Is that from the fiscal monitoring or the BOCC I'm sorry, monitoring? The, um, yeah, the fiscal and compliance monitoring, yeah. Mm. The letter here, yeah. Um, I, uh, Michelle can respond to that for you. Thank you. Sorry. Hi, Michelle. <laughs> Hi, Michelle Ruggles. I happen to bring my PowerPoint description of all the BOCC monitoring. So I'm going to quickly um, So the governance, this isn't going to give you the example quite, but there's 19 standards of what they're looking at. So it includes like board oversight, subcontracts, and let me see if I can um, uh, sorry, I shouldn't have stood up. I don't have it detailed exactly what's inside of the governance category, but I can get that to you. It's pretty straightforward. They go out on the monitoring. It's a combined citywide fiscal and compliance, so all other shared city departments mm. look at it together, and then that they have the 19 criteria that they're looking at. But uh, board governance, like, did they... Um, does it show in the minutes that the uh, agency shared their financial audit or their single aud the audit findings with the board? So there's certain things I want to make sure that actually occurred. So that's this type of thing that they'll check. Is there, um, uh, uh, I guess, board attendance and then their election process and, and such, are those things monitored as well? I don't know all the okay. 19, but I'll find out and let you know. Okay, great. Okay. It's just uh, one of those things. I mean, we, we always look at the management of, you know, contracts and uh, organizations that uh, execute contracts for us. So I think it's important for us to understand, you know, how tight the uh, governance monitoring is as well. Okay. Right, thank you. 
Uh, uh, Michelle, is there not uh, within our own monitoring, not not the uh, city's fiscal monitoring, because governance, uh, and you've hit a real important point, a lot of our issues with nonprofits in the past have been related to uh, not as strong governance as we should mm -hmm. have, right, even on some of our uh, other agencies. So I thought I remembered that we do ourselves as a department also, uh, we, we actually do also focus on governance, don't we? The citywide fiscal and compliance monitoring is also DPH. It's the same difference that the controller's office set up standards that would be looked at across all departments in several categories so that it could be done one time and the vendor wasn't having to do it for each city department. So DPH does it of all of its, excuse me, all of its contracts, including DPH only. The, the joint fiscal and compliance monitoring is, or traditionally was, if there's like two contract, two, two city departments, but we've just slowly been adding our own like standalone so yes it does happen and then if we're the primary vendor which is often the case then we'll be the lead so uh but it's one shared report that gets written at the outcome of the monitoring but so, so i think as you're looking at this because some of our problems have been related to governance so uh if we're sending reports to people saying that, well, it's not part of the score, we think this is important, but you know, you're okay, uh, I'd, uh, I'd like us to really understand that our department really has evaluated because um, maybe that's one of the reasons, maybe we should be emphasizing governance more as part of uh, our, cri our criteria. Yeah, so what we're trying to get off the ground and more comprehensive um, across the board, but we started with the the contracts where people or the vendors where people raised a red flag, but that is that um, I came and talked about the fiscal and financial stability report. So it has a lot of um, components, and so for example, oh, they have no board members, or oh, this something or rather turned completely over. Um, let's see, what did I? Oh, okay, I have an answer to the best governance. That's like magic, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, and now I forgot the actual current question. Oh, just, just a, sig well, well, I don't wanna speak yeah, over I, you, it, it was related oh, to yeah. how, how we can flag or assist, and, and we do assist in governance, so. We definitely uh, assist and it's definitely flagged. And that's flagged and that's the kind of um, real time problem, like the staff turned over, there's no executive director. Those are all flags that get flagged and depending on what other indicators, it's gonna prompt like real time action about it. I think with the fiscal and compliance, they'll monitor, they'll identify the issues, and then depending on what the issue is, they'll either wait till the next year's monitoring to see how it's doing or if it needs an earlier intervention. But the, the nice thing about the joint is it brings all the city departments together and we have come together for certain uh, shared vendors where there's an issue. So I don't, I think if I brought it all together, but I'm gonna go back and look just to say, but I, I think it is covered and it is flagged. Um, it's flagged in the monitoring, but it's also flagged real time. And then the findings from these different reports are all put into a single, that new single document so that you don't have to do a research project to go find the financial report, go find the annual monitoring, go look here that we could put all the findings in one document. So that's the goal of that. And where we've started is with the, I think we identified 10 vendors that had findings or that we, um, that the business office of contract compliance monitoring staff flagged as this problem isn't getting better or, or it's repeating itself. So how do we change it? And then bringing together staff. So that's underway. To, um, okay, 
So this is the answer to the other question. So monitoring staff review governance practices. So um, it's, this won't help you. Based on section three of the standard monitoring form, board of director best practices. So they're not classified as findings for the purposes of this monitoring report letter, but they are important indicators of healthy nonprofit agencies. And, oh, this is actually one. So the, this is a real one, so it was just commenting on that. But um, so that's how it's reported. But I'm going to go back and find the rest of like what falls in those 19. Yeah, since we don't know two. what Section 3 yeah. contains, I think it would be helpful to have some examples of it. I'm particularly interested in uh, board attendance election and then how uh, committee chairs are uh, are selected and such because you know board leadership is such an important aspect of uh, and you know board uh, training is uh, such an important aspect of a healthy organization nonprofit or otherwise so right. yeah okay thanks thank you no I, I think it helps clarify because this is a fiscal response I guess and and therefore, it's good uh, that uh, you pointed out that actually they do look at the issue of governance, but for scoring fiscally, you're okay. And then I guess if there were problems, they would, they would list them, I guess, in, in, in this. Uh, we, we have a clean bill here saying that uh, they are following governance best practice. So I think, uh, as Commissioner Guillermo said, uh, we should know what these best practices are in Section 3. <laughs> so thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, can we go to the next one then, if we have no other questions? Uh, I, I think uh, these are again two very uh, uh, institutes on here too. So this is a very um, these two organizations have been here for uh, a long time, uh, providing uh, very good services. It's good also to see that both of them have good governance. Thank you. Yep. Okay, moving on. Item number five is with mental health management. Um, Canyon Manor uh, requested action as approval of a contract extension with mental health management doing business as Canyon Manor for the provision of ongoing long-term care treatment services in a locked facility to increase the total contract amount with contingency from 5,530,000 to 9,980,000, an increase of 4,450,000, and to extend the current contract term from July 1, 2018 of uh, and uh, ending June 30th, 2023 at five years to now end on June 30th, 2028 for a total of 10 years, adding five more years. The Health Commission previously approved this contract on April 1st of 2018. The new contract is authorized under RFQ 30-2017 um, uh, when the new contract became effective July 1 of 2018. Um, all services are provided in one facility location. Um, this amendment adds funding for an additional five years, increasing the total contract term amount. There is no change in the annual compensation amount. Um, we received your questions earlier today, earlier today regarding what has been the results of monitoring for services at Canyon Manor um, and if there have been state inspections of the MHARC and the results. Uh, Young Jun Kim, the Interim Director of Residential System of Care for BHS, is here virtually um, to respond to the to the questions submitted earlier and any others you may have on this contract. Yunjun. Hi, my name is Yunjun Kim, uh, Interim Director of Residential System of Care at the Behavioral Health Services. Uh, so, California Department of Health Care Services uh, Mental Health Licensing Section conducts annual audits and survey for Canyon Manor. So, which is a, a licensed as a, a mental health rehab center. So, for 89 beds located in Novato in California. So, uh, to ensure compliance with the licensing requirements, uh, the results of the state's evaluation are comprehensive, covering all of the Title IX regulation, specifically Chapter 3.5, uh, Section 781 to 800, I'm sorry, 781 to 788, so it covers about the 50, over 50 criteria. So Kenya Manor responds to the state with the plans of corrections as needed. So also they uh, recently responded to their survey results from the state, which are compliant with the regulations. 
So in addition, uh, we DPH provides uh, provide internal evaluation for Canyon Manor facility, giving monthly visits and attending interdisciplinary team and utilization review meetings with the Canyon Manor staff and San Francisco Conservator's office to discuss clients' progress and treatment plan. So uh, if uh, uh, there are pressing issues involving clients, so bi-monthly or weekly visit may occur. So also uh, our DPH role is to make sure Canyon Manor services meet the DPH quality of care criteria uh, by reviewing client notes and intervening, intervening uh, when necessary by consulting with the medical providers as well as uh, psychiatric providers uh, on the care of each client. So um, our uh, DPH current uh, average bed sense as a Canyon Manor is eight to nine, uh, especially the facilities and specialties providing care for conservative clients who have a severe psychosis and drug use uh, or uh, and uh, assaultive behavior. So, and the Canyon Manor has been the to-go uh, facility for some of our very challenging clients uh, that are in need of long-term stabilization. So Canyon Manor met our performance objective of not returning more than three uh, San Francisco residents per month to psychiatric emergency services. So they have been uh, pretty good at keeping clients at the current level of care, sending actually only one client back to psychiatric emergency services in the past year. Thank you. Thank you. Um... That was a very nice answer, uh, Commissioner. Uh, no question. Just, just uh, as I'm listen, as I was listening uh, to the answer, it just sort of struck me how difficult this this work is, and you know the the um, the need to support it. Uh, I think is very very important for us as a department, and I wish we have we were able to provide more beds uh, as needed. Absolutely. You you said the uh, they're actually located in Nevada, right? Right. And, yeah, in the Perry County. And should uh, do they have uh, uh, openings to which we try to also send other patients, or there because it sounds like we have a number of these problem patients still in our system, uh, and, and they sound like they really do a good job. I mean, they've been there for many years, and this is. One of those in which I think we've, we've uh, asked that the uh, we have a five-year point in which we would be reviewing a contract, even though we've extended a. I mean, even though we authorize a contract for ten years. So this is a very good example. Saying, yeah. here at the five-year point, we are getting uh, a update on how well we're doing, and we're going to extend it the other five years without having to re. Uh, uh, Rebid it again, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I'm just wondering. Uh, they have 89 beds. Uh, it sounds like could couldn't we use more from here and and maybe uh, move uh, uh, have the ability to help take care of you know the challenges we're facing here in the city. Yes, we have tried multiple times to expand our bed capacity. So Canyon Manor definitely is one of the biggest amount of the rehab center uh, in the single location in California. So, but however, I think uh, almost all the time they are at the bed capacity. So, so as a uh, the nature of actually the mental health rehab center in San Francisco in California is uh, uh, very few health care facilities running uh, these uh, these mental health care, uh, rehab centers. So, it's a competition is uh, pretty actually high, and then so uh, it doesn't matter where the mental health rehab center is located. And then all California counties are competing over the beds. So uh -huh. we have reached out to the Canyon Men many, many times. And also we couldn't, we even actually offered to pay for the empty beds. So they <laughs> didn't want to do it actually. So yeah. this is kind of, that's why there's no secure the beds. So we just to try to uh, just, to, uh, you know, fill the actually the uh, beds as soon as our clients are discharged. So. <laughs> it's just kind of a dilemma. Lose it. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Well, well, at least we're 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 trying to hold the number we have there, right? <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, any further questions? No, thank you. No. Yeah, thank you so much for your support. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's go on to our next contract. 
Okay, item number six is with UCSF for the vouchers for veggies or ESF program. Requested action as approval of a new contract agreement with uh, the regents of the University of California, San Francisco uh, for vouchers for veggies ESF for a total contract amount with contingency of $1,187,200 and a contract term of August 1, 23 to June 30th of 2025, one year and 11 months. While this is a new contract, it is for services that were recently approved at the May 5th, 2023 Health Commission meeting uh, for our contract uh, with, um, with um, maternal, child, and adolescent health. Uh, this contract, uh, this new contract with primary care provides food vouchers to, re to reduce disparities in chronic disease outcomes uh, for clients in primary care. Uh, the annual amount is 530000 and that, that includes an indirect cost of 15% for personnel and operating expenses. Um, of the remaining amount of 416042 about 110805 will be applied to a 0.9 FTE needed to manage the program, um, and uh, 402574 will be applied directly to the vouchers. Um, including, which includes the service fees for the vouchers. This new agreement exercises administrative sole source 21.5B um, funding will be, be provided, uh, provide support under the program administration modality. Um, the, we're re, uh, requesting approval of the total contract amount 1187200 for primary care practice improvement program or PIP uh, special revenue funds in the amount of 530000 for 11 months um, and primary care uh, practice improvement um, special revenue funds in the amount of 530000 for fiscal year 24-25 um, and an amount of 127200 for the uh, uh, contingency value for both years. Um, please note the practice improvement program of San Francisco Health Plans pay for performance for medical clinics and medical groups to uh, achieve improvements in system and health outcomes, as you are aware. Um, regarding the question submitted earlier today, the prior annual amount for comparison and the prior contracting, um, what was the prior amount for comparison's sake and the prior contract monitoring report? Um, this contract is an additional contract with a separate system of care of, uh, for a contract with, uh, for services provided by ESF, um, which was approved by the Health Commission at the May 5th meeting. Um, the contract, uh, that contract that was approved in May was with a new contract with MCAH for one year, um, July 1, 23 through 6, 30, 24, for an amount of 1,064,000. Um, since this was the first contract and it just began on July 1st, 23, um, there's not yet been any monitoring or evaluation to, to share. Um, if you have any um, programmatic related questions, we have Blake Gregory, primary care director of population health and quality, um, and she also serves as medical director of the Com complex care program. She can answer any other questions you may have. Uh, yeah, I, did, I have a question. Um, could you describe to us um, where again are these uh, uh, clients, where are they uh, recruited from, or wh where, where are the sites where these vouchers are uh, distributed, uh, and how are, how are they recruited? It's just, um, I know it's a recent program, so I know there's probably still- Where are they the served, and how are they recruited? Yeah. Dr. Gregory, are you available to answer that specific program? I question? am. Thank you. Yes, thank you for your question. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, these uh, all the clients we serve are within the San Francisco Health Network primary care department. So the patients that are assigned to us and impaneled with us and actively seeking care. And the way we identify these clients is through registries um, by, you know, including chronic, like that include chronic diseases um, such as diabetes and hypertension. And so we specifically comb these registries for patients who have uncontrolled chronic disease um, and, uh, and again, they're all patients who are actively uh, participating in primary care at our sites. Um, and then once the patients are identified using our registries, we have a dedicated navigator who will reach out to the patients, um, offer the service, and offer you know to enroll them in the vouchers for a veggie program, and also offer additional wraparound chronic disease management services that include a multi multidisciplinary care team of a clinical pharmacist, a nutritionist. Um, and uh, nursing and primary care. 
Great, thank you. I, I'm curious uh, when we do our, when we are able to get a, a report uh, as to the efficacy uh, of the of the program uh, relative to whatever conditions uh, the patients have been identified with, and and how this food voucher program improves their overall well-being. So, looking yeah, forward to absolutely. that. Thank we you. Are too, and 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 if it, if it's helpful, I'm happy to share the results of a preliminary pilot that we did at at one of our primary care clinics. We already do have some of that data. If that would be helpful for me to share, I'm happy to do that. Sure. Please, um, please share that so through we, me through me, Mark Morowitz. Okay. So, uh, Mark, I would just send you those materials. It, it, it's not a report; it's it's a slide deck, but um, but we can put it in whatever format is needed. Just can you just let me know, Mark, what you need? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, right, when, when you're still on there, you're talking about uh, we're distributing it to the San Francisco Health Network, but is, this, is, is, is not the PIP program for only the San Francisco Health Plan or it's for the entire network? Um, as I understand it, the, the PIP funds can be applied to um, uh, clients who are not SFHP members. Oh, so we're okay. offering it to all network patients, not just SFHP patients. That's my understanding about how we're permitted to use these funds with this program. Okay, so so it'd be very good to take a look at what the pilot showed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sounds like very innovative. Uh, not just innovative, but important. Next uh, contract, please. Thank you, Dr. Gregory. Um, the seventh item is with UCSF Ward 86 for the HALT um, Center of Excellence. Requested action as approval of a contract amendment with the uh, UCSF Ward 86 for the HALT COE. HALT stands for Homeless, Aging, and Long-Term Survivors Center of Excellence um, to increase the total contract amount with contingency to an amount of $26,479,764 and to extend the current contract term from March 1st, 2020 to June 30th, 2024, um, which is a term of four years and four months to extend it through 228-2030 for a total of 10 years. The Health Commission previously approved this contract on April 21st of 2020. Um, UCSF provides primary medical care services through their COE model at Ward 86 with an integrated delivery system that also provides client supportive services um, there and with their subcontractor provider, providers. The proposed amendment exercises options authorized under RFP 5-2019 Funding will continue to provide support under the ambulatory outpatient medical care modality. Um, and um, again, this proposed amendment is subject to approval by the San Francisco Board of Supervisors. As far as reason for the funding change um, for the new amount of $26,479,764, which reflects an increase of $16,480,892 due to the following um, multiple changes, a reduction in the unspent um, fu uh, funds in the amount of $22 for Ryan White Part A funding for fiscal year 2021 uh, and 21-22. Um, addi additional general fund um, CODB uh, in the amount of $114,032 for fiscal year 23-24. Additional Ryan White Part A cost of doing business uh, in the amount of 533 for fiscal year 23-24. Um, uh, uh, an additional general fund in the amount of $12,573,230 or an annual amount of $2,514,646 for the term of July 1, 2024 through 630, 2029. Um, additional general fund funding in the amount of $1,676,431 for um, uh, July 1, 2029 through 228, 2030, prorated for eight months because of the change in the fiscal year. Um, additional Ryan White Part A funding in the amount of 94,572 um, or 15,762 um, prorated for uh, each fiscal year 24, 25 through 29, 30, and an increase in the amount of 2 million and 23,116 to the contingency value. Um, which was applied through fiscal years 23, 24, and 29, 30. Um, the current contingency total will be uh, 2,024,957. Previously, the amount was $1,841. Um, please note there is an annual funding level uh, reduction of 41,250 um, due to a uh, uh, one time additional general fund in the amount of 155812 that was included for fiscal year 22-23 only. 
um, partially offset by a 4.75 um, general fund cost of doing business in the amount of 114.29 for fiscal year 23-24, and a 3.5% Ryan White um, Part A cost of doing business increase of 533 for the same year. If you have any additional programmatic questions, again, we have Beth Neary, Assistant Director of HIV Health Services, available to help with those. Uh, Commissioner? Just uh, with uh, regard to the patient satisfaction surveys, will they be uh, uh, implement? Uh, when will they will s uh, start being implemented again? You know, the, from from what I remember from the note that um, BOC had, C had provided, I w would imagine that um, they should be available in the next monitoring cycle to follow this one, which was for. Um, hold on one sec. <laughs> Too many pieces of paper. Uh, yeah, the the um, the last monitoring was for fiscal year 2021. So hopefully, when they do the report for 21-22, there will be um, some client satisfaction um, surveys that have been delivered that we can uh, speak to. Hopefully, offhand, I don't know for sure. I can f check and follow up. Okay, it's it. I mean, I think it's a similar question that we've had with a number of the. Uh, so contracts COVID. that have been uh, suspended in terms of the satisfaction surveys and such because of COVID. So just wondering when all of that will start up again. Okay, I will check with um, the system of care and let you know. Can you that. respond? Yes. Um, so uh, Bill and I attended this monitoring visit this year um, and they weren't ready to prepare. So the next monitoring may not have their results from their survey, but they have started issuing the survey. In the past, they had done a separate paper survey in clinic, um, but that hasn't really aligned well with COVID. And since their Ward 86 is part of the San Francisco Health Network primary care site, um, they are already participating in some uh, telephone surveys on a monthly basis with a random sample of patients. And since their um, client, like their patients are almost entirely uh, HIV positive, they do have some PrEP uh, prevention patients as well now, but essentially their clinic-wide survey will also serve for their uh, survey for these programs as well. Um, so we will have that on an ongoing basis and it's been collected yet, but not yet analyzed and responded to. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Uh, further questions? No. If not, then uh, we'll move on to our next uh, contract. Okay. The item number eight, the last item on this month's uh, report, requested action on the approval of uh, agreement with Horizons Unlimited of San Francisco uh, for their prevention education program to continue services that were previously provided in uh, uh, former contract, uh, contract ID number uh, 1000010302. The total contract amount with contingency for this new contract is 1891328 and reflect a term of July 1, 2023 through June 30th of 2025 for two years. Um, these services were previously approved by the Health Commission on um, December 4th of 2018, and also on May 2nd of 2023 um, for the previous contract I just referenced. The contract will continue the prevention education program that will provide substance use disorder prevention activities to elementary, middle school, and high school age students and their families residing in the Mission District and throughout the city and county of San Francisco. Um, this agreement is authorized under a 21.8G grant waiver. And the reason for the change um, for the total contract amount of 1,891,328. It's the annual funding for fiscal year 23-24 of 827,787. Funding for fiscal year 24-25 also includes a CODB increase uh, for a total amount of 860,898. Um, and a 12% contingency was added to the current and future years for 202,642. Um, uh, again, total requested amount for the two-year contract is 1,891,328. For comparative purposes, um, the same the same annual amount um, uh, for these services of 827,787 in this contract is what was in the contract that you previously approved in May um, for the last fiscal year. Um, in the other services in that former Horizons contract will be continued in that uh, previous contract um, that was uh, funded through the RFP 26-2016. Um, if you have additional programmatic questions, 
um, from the Children, Youth, and Family System of Care. We have Chris Lavoie, the Assistant Director of CYF, and Rebecca Matthew, the Program Manager of Substance Use Disorder Services at CYF. Commissioner? None. Uh, I, I, uh, as, as I was reading this again, uh, I, I guess how effective are we in the prevention programs? I, I know that you've met certain measurements here, but uh, just trying to figure out uh, how we think we're, uh, you know, um, I, I guess uh, moving the needle, or, or, or what do we use as a base? Because you're all the way down to the elementary school in the substance abuse uh, uh, or substance use issues, or is this sort of preventive to to say this is a bad thing to do, like you know, tobacco cessation, uh, rather than trying to, uh, or is it, and maybe is and or uh, that we're uh, dealing with uh, in a different age group, the underage drinking, mm -hmm. so. Just trying to understand how we're balancing true prevention or uh, trying to then uh, get people off of substances. Sure, I can, uh, I can speak a little bit to this. Um, we do offer, it's primary prevention services, so therefore it is um, aimed at uh, young, young children, um, young adults who are not using currently to our knowledge. And so it is an effort to build protective factors that would order to prevent them from um, using substances or abusing substances later in life. And the, and the evidence-based practices that we've selected are normed based on the increase of protective factors um, against substance abuse particularly. And so it is focusing more on things that are not necessarily targeting substance use, but it is weaving in some knowledge and some psychoeducation into, into the uh, curriculum. But it really is uh, more about building up the family unit and um, individual skills within the, the participants to um, offset the likelihood of using substances later in life. Oh, very good. Okay, thank you. Sure. Appreciate that. Uh, so, um, do we have any public comment? Since there's, there's still no one on the line. Okay. So, we're at the end of the uh, contracts report with eight contracts, and we're prepared for a motion for a recommendation to the commission. So moved. Uh, which way are we moving? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> recommendation. <laughs> okay, recommendation to the commission. Approval, yeah. uh, all right. And uh, I would second that. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 We will uh, recommend the contracts report to the commission for its approval. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Very much. Uh, and and uh, let me say there is a lot of good work in here, and, and, and really it's good to see that a lot of it is continuing uh, to be done. And, uh, um, uh, you know, we're, we're looking at areas that are really important. So thank you very much. And thanks to all those who helped present and answer questions. Yes. We can move on to item four, which is a request for approval of a new professional services agreement with HTL 587. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, the uh, Dr. Joanna Evelyn, um, who is the um, Chief Medical Officer of the Whole Person Integrated Care to introduce the program and answer any questions you might have. But before I do that, we had a question earlier today um, the, uh, asking about what, what is the option to extend and will any extension return to the commissioners. Um, the monthly units of service um, in, in this new contract in the memo you'll see are estimated to be um, $100,000 a month. Um, initially, this contract has a term of 10 months. Um, so if it, through the 10-month term as it is now, it would um, um, expend about half, about a million dollars of the total contract amount, which is in front of you, which is $2,016,000. Um, if additional funding beyond the total approved amount of $2,016,000 2, is needed, then the contract would return uh, to you all for approval. Uh, but the, uh, with you approving the higher amount, then they're able to um, extend the dollar amount of the contract at, uh, if, if needed, if uh, additional services are required. And then one thing to also note is um, in the initial uh, copy of this, it referenced that these services were used for placement of clients who have tested positive for or been exposed to COVID or other communicable diseases, but there's also a um, uh, managed alcohol program that's part of the placement as well. And Dr. Evelyn is here to introduce the program. And I emailed that version of uh, the contract to you all. Yeah. <clears throat> 
Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Um, so the purpose of this contract is to provide hotel rooms for two separate programs housed in one hotel site. Uh, the first, again, is our isolation and quarantine services for people experiencing homelessness, and the second is for our managed alcohol program. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with our MAP program, managed alcohol program is a 20-bed residential program serving people with severe alcohol use disorder who are, uh, do not have abstinence as their treatment goal and clients receive um, alcohol fixed doses in a medically monitored setting. Um, we believe individuals do not need to want abstinence in order to be offered support and dignity. Um, in terms of the communicable disease services already at our current site, um, in addition to COVID, we've been able to offer isolation quarantine to people with MPOX, receiving tuberculosis treatment, antibiotic resistant infections, as well as um, syphilis treatment for pregnant people experiencing homelessness. Um, just to add to the question about a potential extension of the site, we've actually been looking for a new home for this uh, site uh, for the last two years, have toured many different hotels, are now moving on an expedited timeline due to um, learning of um, seismic retrofitting needs at our current site, which for a program serving very vulnerable clients is um, obviously not a, a place we wish to continue to operate. Um, so if um, you know, we're looking at other new permanent sites um, and some of them are potentially require construction. So if there were delays in that move to the permanent site, we would seek an extension. Our goal is to move this program as few times as possible because the client population served is so vulnerable. Happy to answer any other questions. I just want, I, and you said, Mark, that you sent us a, a revised? I did. I'm um, sorry, I, I didn't get a chance to see it. So. My question then is, in the description, it only speaks to the uh, COVID beds. Uh, does the revised one also speak to this? It does. I'll, okay. I'll give you the paper copy. It, 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 it does add managed alcohol program, but it doesn't actually specify how many are divided into each. Right. So my understanding is the um, hotel would offer us 31 rooms, a few of which will be used for administrative and office space. And then we would have uh, about six isolation and quarantine rooms and then 20 rooms for the managed alcohol program. So if the, um, if the beds aren't needed for COVID later on, will the beds that are reserved for managed uh, alcoholism, are they gonna remain or, they, are they, or do they go away also? Um, so the managed alcohol program, we hope to continue on an ongoing basis. So assuming we get to a place where we will no longer need isolation and quarantine for communicable disease, we would hope to continue the MAP program. I, I think what we've seen in the last few years is there probably al always will be some need, again, beyond COVID for diseases like tuberculosis, syphilis treatment, and that for people experiencing homelessness, being able to offer you know, hotel-based treatment really improves people's ability to be safely cared for and cured. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, thank you. So, so it, it's marked as rooms and services. So you've kind of described the 31 rooms. So how much also pays for services and what kind of services are we providing for COVID versus or and uh, in regards to the banished alcohol? I mean, what, what, what are we doing for each of these cohorts? Uh, right. So uh, in addition to, you know, the hotel site and the DPH service, staff services provided on site, we also have a community-based organization partner, Community Forward, um, who's our existing partner for our managed alcohol program, medical respite sites. I, I believe this contract is just for the hotel sites. I, do, do you have details on, is this including... Yeah, I'm happy to look into, the, you know, if there's things like laundry or other pieces that are incorporated. My understanding is that this is just for the hotel costs, operate, hotel operating costs of the services they're referring to. Alright, so, so are we saying that uh, each of the rooms are $3,225? That's, that's, that, that's what's listed here per month? Um, yes. I mean, that, uh, see, I, yeah. I was thinking that if you had said and services, then it might not just be the room rent, yeah. but you know, you were also bringing in other services. 
I, I, I'd imagine that you'd have to have linen, you would have to have cleaning or whatnot. So I'm really curious, you know, what, what was the base rate for paying for the room versus what other services are being provided? Uh, we've heard all these stories of different uh, times that uh, we've rented rooms for the homeless, but it looks like, and, and I don't know what's provided for them, but it looks like uh, sometimes you know, it's kind of left in disarray and not very well taken care of. So I can't imagine, you know, staff allowing certain things to happen in rooms that we read about that all of a sudden then, uh, you know, the uh, uh, hotel management uh, owners come and say, now, now you owe me so much money because uh, you haven't kept up the place. So that's, that's what, you know, what was curious. Uh, it, these are not medical services, but they must be some sort of services. Uh, yeah, I will clarify. My understanding is that this contract with um, uh, HTL 587 is just for housing costs, and I, I agree this is an expensive program, and we're actively looking, particularly as we continue it, at ways to lower program costs. Our existing lease um, at our um, 465 um, Grove Street site is also quite expensive, so I I'm, will double check, but the, this may actually be a, a bit of a savings. Uh, again, our timing to move the site was very limited, and this is a program where any disruption in services would result in these folks being back on the street. I will add that even though this is an expensive program, it's also, um, you know, we think a program that's really significantly decreased um, utilization costs for the folks involved. So in our initial analysis of um, um, cost effectiveness in the uh, first cohort of patients in this program compared to the six months prior to MAP enrollment, we saw a fourfold decrease in emergency department utilization, twofold decrease in EMS activation, and a twofold decrease in hospitalization. So these were folks who were going to the ER sometimes, you know, upwards of 10 times a day. Mm -hmm. They were very high utilizers of our alcohol sobering services. So, and also seen a lot of, um, you know, sense of health, hope, and stability for clients enrolled in this program. So, so what's the turnover? I mean, how long do people stay in this program before then either being housed or hopefully not put back on the street? But, right, so the, but, this is a, a longitudinal program where people stay as long as they need to, and I think we're seeing, given the, the high acuity of people involved, that's often going to be quite a long time. So um, you know, the average length of stay over the total duration of the program is seven months, and then for the last year, the average length of stay has been 11 months, and that you know we're encouraging people to stay as as long as it's the right environment for them. When people decide it's time for them to transition to permanent supportive housing or other settings, we help them to do so. But again, these are are very sick folks who are not treatment seeking. So you want to go over those statistics again in the uh, report that you said, oh, only so that we can report it to the remainder of the commission. I mean, I think that's sort of mm -hmm. impressive the reduction in emergency room services yeah. and whatnot. Yeah, so. we're, we're really proud of this program. This is the first managed alcohol program in the United States. It's a widely accepted model in Canada and other countries. We're regularly approached by folks from other cities who are wanting to start this program. So um, fourfold decrease in ED utilization. And again, the um, so that was uh, from a total of 540 emergency room visits for the participants to down to 147. Um, alcohol sobering center visits went from 756 visits in six months prior to 60 visits. And th so, that's for the, the uh, clients or the residents that are actually in the hotel, mm -hmm. right? Yes, people who are enrolled in the MAP program in our initial analysis. Um, so um, twofold decrease in emergency medical services activation and twofold decrease in hospitalizations. What, what I would suggest, though, is uh, in the contract, uh, uh, in the breakdown of uh, items, it says rooms and services. So if this is really just for the rooms, it should just say for the rooms. Uh, and it is still quite a high cost per room. I mean, that, that's part of why we're seeing this as a temporary location yeah. for the program. For a permanent location, we're really looking at um, you know, sites already um, you know, owned by the department where we won't be paying these kind of, of monthly rents. It definitely is, does not feel sustainable in the long term. And this is a program we want to continue long term. Yeah, yeah. I mean, given how impressive the results are, mm -hmm. um, I, I, I do think it's, it becomes overall cost effective. But I also think, you know, just from a public perception, 
uh, you know, if, you know, a one bedroom apartment in San Francisco is $3,500, but you're paying, you know, $3,200 for a single room with no services, you know, that it's hard for people to understand what the overall benefit is relative to just looking at the costs. So, uh, but especially if it's really just for the rooms and there's no services. Yeah. Okay, we'll definitely get back to you with that information. My, again, my understanding is this is rooms and perhaps the services associated with keeping you know, rooms going, but, but not any of the clinical or support services that our staff or our CBO partner is offering. But, but again, th those statistics are quite impressive. Uh, so I, I, I would agree with uh, Commissioner Chow that you know, if we could share that data with the rest of the commission, that would be really Really important somehow also yeah I'm happy to understand. come back and talk further about this program and um, share updated cost effectiveness analyses as well thank you good um, so um, nobody on the public line no on Great. The public line. so we can have a motion as to what we want to do with this contract okay. again uh, move to recommend to the full commission okay and I will second that all in favor please okay. say aye 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 Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for uh, your time. Really appreciate the information too. And thanks for the great work too. Uh, item five is the annual source waiver usage report and this is a discussion item. Would you like me to pull up the presentation or are you just using it as a talking point? Would, uh, I, I don't have... need the pre presentation, I read the. Okay, Yeah. great. Thank you, Mark. Okay, Michelle Ruggles, director of the DPH business office. And I just wanted, starting back in 2015, we agreed to bring this report to the health commission. And so uh, the specific report, which we call in shorthand the um, Sunshine Ordinance Report, is a report of sole source waivers that the department entered into in the prior fiscal year and specifically in the ordinance it's professional services contracts that the department entered into during the past year beginning this year we're also reporting on the usage of or we're reporting on sole source grant agreements and the terminologies uh, grant agreements for what we're used to in DPH often speaks to grants that you apply for and you got federal or state funding. In this context, what grant agreements is speaking to is the boilerplate, which is a um, there's professional services contracts and grant agreements. So it's kind of the same thing. There's some different procedures that go with grant agreements. Back in January of 2022, the Board of Supervisors updated Chapter 21G for the grant agreement. And when they did that, DPH jumped on. We were part of helping uh, make sure it fit what we needed. It fits better, in my opinion, for uh, nonprofit contracted services. So we then came to the Health Commission and sought approval to use grant agreements and the approval process that's required in the legislation for approving our usage of sole source waivers that meet the category. So included also in the legislation was a requirement to start reporting annually on how many contract, um, how many grant agreements a department entered into during the prior year. So this is the first time that you're seeing it. So what you have are two separate um, reports in the one attachment, sorry. Uh, and the, the sole source agreements uh, that I was calling Sunshine Ordinance is really part of chapter 6724. And so those sole source waivers, except for one category, are all approved by the Office of Contract Administration, or OCA. At the end of each year, OCA publishes a report that's all the sole sources that the departments have entered into. So while the ordinance is for professional services contracts, the report done by OCA is everything, commodities, like just widgets, and, and so 
we've been asked to include to tie to that report so that there's no confusion and anyone wanting, you know, it's just easier for the public to compare. So the report you're seeing this year is longer for fiscal year 22-23 and it has um, more categories. Do you have this document? I might just reference. It's a one pager I sent. Is that? It's, uh, I put that on, the, um, each of you have it on your pile. It's, uh, it's, it's actually, yeah, it's. It just looks, yeah. I didn't give them a color copy. I guess. After the minutes for the copy. Here. Oh, okay. I see. So. so this was trying to break down the information so it was a little bit more palatable and also to try to answer some of your questions. But in the first top box, that's a summary of Chapter 6724, Sunshine Ordinance Waivers. And it's divided into professional contracts with the sole source waiver and then commodities. And so um, professional contracts is also, you can see the categories. And so I just went through and counted <laughs> so that you could see them. But um, these are the categories of why we sought sole source waivers like software licenses and equipment maintenance, a proprietary article, there's no other source or substitute for the item, a pilot project, and then chapter 2142, we report here, that's a sole source list that you, Health Commission approve in advance, and then if we enter into it, um, we entered into nine, and so we're reporting it. What's new this year is the column that says modifications to existing waivers, because we had existing waivers, but there was an action that took place to modify it, either increase the amount or extend the term, and because of that, it showed up on the, o the Office of Contract Administration report. And then the second part, commodities, that is just items that were purchased, versus on the top, like, I guess if you bought software off the shelf, it would be a commodity, but a lot of almost everything DPH uses, there's a maintenance agreement that goes with it. So that would trigger a contract. So we entered into 48 new um, contracts for those items or those categories that are listed, and we modified 28 existing um, agreements or sole source waivers. And then under commodities, we entered into 43 new ones and modified six. And then the second report is the 21G, Chapter 21G grant agreement. So there's two kinds of grant agreements. There are grant agreements, and it depends what the, why you're needing it. But if there's one category that does not require a waiver to be approved, which means it doesn't come to uh, you, the Health Commission for approval. And so that's the top category that we have 10 of. And of those 10, uh, six, we had six that this is the category, you can see it in full, but made to a specific entity as a result of the requirement of the funding source. So basically of these six, Three of them went to the Board of Supervisors, you might remember Baker, PRC, um, that were approved by an ordinance, but the other three uh, was because a vendor was named in a grant application, so there would be no point in doing a sole source when the funder right, approved the, that. So that's what those are that don't get approved by the um, Health Commission through Mark Morowitz. And then, the other one is grant to governmental entities that can only be practically be performed by that entity. So those four all represent pass through. We get the funding and give it to another county. So again, no point in doing a, sol sort, um, a solicitation for that. And then um, the next category is the category that you approve the individual waivers and so the way that we've used it, um, it's the same. There's two criteria that we're allowed to use 
to seek a sole source waiver for a contract. And we use the same example, I mean the same criteria, but I broke it into what the two different things are. So the first, so of the eight that we entered into in fiscal year 22-23, uh, three of them were new initiatives that needed to get off the ground, like street crisis response team, the trucks going around. And, um, so when there's a new initiative and it fits, we're trying to make it a grant agreement instead of a professional services contract. So that's what those three were, was to get new initiatives. And then the other five are all the same category, and it's in fact, um, Horizons is one example that you just had, you just approved in your agreement. We had five, uh, the, the substance abuse prevention plan has federal guidelines and the federal guidelines have been delayed and they don't wanna do the solicitation until they have the federal guidelines. And so we have pulled that program out of the master contracts because the old solicitation expired and we're continuing it. Um, we put two years, that's what it, you just approved for Horizons, but we hope, it's actually by next July, that we will have the federal guidelines and reissue the um, solicitation and then new vendors will be selected. So in this example, the approval from the Health Commission allowed us to continue existing services, addressing that there's this weirdness of lack of guidelines and that we needed more time. So that is how we used um, the sole source or the Chapter 21G this past year. And it's really DPH, I mean, maybe there's a random one or two in the past, but this is us jumping in now, so. This will be a longer report. And so we submit the report to the board and then, um, I don't know, if there's anything else that you have questions on. I did, just as a reminder, at the end of the PowerPoint presentation, I documented from our prior presentation, the sole source waiver approval process, how that flows. And then some of the common reasons the department seeks the sole source waiver which the most common are, we just discussed it, which is new initiatives and uh, gaps in solicitations being issued or complete where we want to continue the services. And commissioners are still uh, knowing on the public comment line. So the back page you want to exploit. Oh, sorry, yeah, there's a back page. Um, I just went through and totaled the categories. Your question, whoever's question that was, was just like a totally logical question. What is the percentage of sole source to total funding? I don't, I didn't, I don't, I have to think about how to do that. The problem or the challenge is it's not apples to apples. I can tell you our annual funding, right? 1.1 billion just for, um, this is across the whole department for professional services agreements. Uh, but the waivers are approved for multi-year. Mm. And so it's not really comparing apples to apples. And then if I go and I get all the contracts approval, it's gonna be like billions of dollars for the whole term. So I don't think that's super meaningful to gauge. So I think Maybe what I would look at for the future, and the future can be sooner than later, the next year is like how many contracts. Like if we have 300 contracts, three are sole source, or something like that, um, that maybe, I don't know, but I'd be open to ideas, but that's why I didn't put, I couldn't answer your question, I just gave you the total funding just to sort of have something. Might there be a way then to break down how many are three year or five year by amount or by number? We could do that. It's, that um, it's a little bit more of a you know, right. context, yeah. Yeah, but then are you comparing it to one year of total funding of that type? Or, uh, you know, I don't, 
yeah so one year three year five year, i don't whatever yeah. but if what we're tr trying to understand i'm not quite sure what the purpose of the 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 dollars in review are going to you know okay. yeah so maybe some a little yeah, bit more I, I, yeah i would agree I, I guess the question that was in my mind was Within sole source on an annual basis, how much did the sole source contracts represent as part of an annual? So if an, an annual basis were at 1.1 billion, let's say, that are in contracts, then uh, is it that uh, 1 million is right. in the sole sources so that then they're less significant? or? Is it that it's 900 million and yeah. therefore everything's in sole source? I mean, it's just sort of the, uh, taking the two extremes. Yeah, the contracts or agreements, grant agreements, that we set up with nonprofit agencies, that is much easier to look at annually and kind of pull it out. And we could do that. The challenge with the hospital commodities and is that they have a contract that's for an amount for a term, but it's not like they don't get, they don't provide typical, or well, I'll just say, I don't think, it's not usually a one year budget. It's here's your budget until you run out of money within this term. So it's a little bit, we kind of wedge it in to, to, into our reporting so that, just to give you an idea, a projection of the annual amount but that would be harder on the hospital side if the if but we can think about it but i but for for cbo nonprofits that we could, that would be i know how i know how i could do that and it would just be looking at like the annual funding notification figuring out the amount that sole source yeah i i i think the real uh, sort of the real issue is uh <coughs> and has been in the past a public complaint is that we so source everything and that we never open up contracts and uh and, and often as we know when you when we do contracts they uh, we get one bidder or something after all the work but right. uh, uh I, I i think it would be helpful to know that because these numbers of so source are are um, very helpful and much lower than i had thought they were and and that uh, so it's probably within the nonprofit yeah. if uh, so just to limit this and limit the work okay uh that uh if, if we could have an idea of what the percent then of sole source contracts represented within the total amount that we had then it would tell us that uh let's say 70 percent of it was really open bid and so forth and 30 percent for very important reasons were sole source that I think that's one of the things we're kind of looking at to try to be sure that uh, we are giving opportunity to everybody uh, and, and not just simply using so source as a uh, contract. And, and if, I, if I may, I'm sorry to interrupt you, um, no. it might mean that there might be a footnote on that data saying this represents CBO yeah. uh, contract agreements and not, and there are other kinds and just so it's an estimate, you know, so that everyone is clear. So, so it's, you know, it, it uh, Obviously, we don't have to go to the penny, and we don't anyway. But uh, I, I think, is that going to be too hard? I, 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 you see, the purpose is not There's to break it down necessarily into one, three, or five years. Right. But to understand what the total of contracts are that are really so source but on the, on the uh, nonprofit side. Okay. That, that's really where yeah. I think we're uh, most uh, uh, sensitive to the public. Yeah, because the... Uh, the um the 6724 uh, sole source. I mean, they, they could be. I mean, there's such a variety, you know. And they're not. They're not generally programmatic, right? I mean, they're right. you know, really yeah. sort of, you know, for sort of a concrete. It's delivery. for operational support yeah. for the department yeah. so, yeah. by and large. Yeah. And it's actually, as, as uh, Commissioner Chow said, it's really surprising how low it is actually compared to the overall. Uh, department budget so it's a it's a little bit surprising so even that i think is useful to know yes. that yeah 
I mean, we, we, we get a huge long list, right, of so source, and it looks like so many things are going out so source, and, and yet uh, you, you really quantify that very nice. I, that, that's a lot of work, and thank you so much. And so we just simplify it to uh, say, you know, what is the annual that is under the uh, nonprofit side? Uh, I think the footnote uh, Mr. Morwich uh, was recommending is also very useful, so that then, um, you know, you footnote the report and say, you know, if the nonprofits, it was only uh, yeah. so much or a percent of our total, uh, you know, so uh, our t total nonprofit contracts. That would that, that would be helpful. Yeah. For the future. Uh, otherwise, there's a, just so much work. I want to thank you for uh, again uh, reminding us <laughs> what this is and and also that breakdown of basically uh, the commodities versus the uh, you know actual uh, uh, professional and then uh, uh, understanding what the other administrative code is which is really that grants are really not grants as we understood them right. but they're really the contracts so yeah <laughs> okay uh, that was a uh, so, so once again you've helped uh, explain a very complicated uh, 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 a set of rules <laughs> okay yeah, I, I agree, and I think, uh, again, it, it, it uh, gives us a reminder of how much work is involved in administrating, you know, even a, a relatively low dollar amount of contracts, which are really important to the ongoing operation and programmatic yeah. services for the, for the department and for the city, so appreciate all of that. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, where are we now, Mark? In our uh, so I'm going to note again, there's no one on the public comment line. We are on, on item six, emerging issues. Okay, so do we have any emerging issues? The only, I think that this is something we've raised before, but, you know, I, again, uh, it strikes me every so often as to the uh, indirect amount of the administrative overhead amount that we are limited to. Uh, for our, uh, uh, particularly for the nonprofit CBOs, you know, when you think about how inflation has gone up uh, in uh, just even the last couple of years and how difficult it is for people to uh, to live and work here in San Francisco, that 12 percent is just it, it's, it's actually 15. They can or 15. it can go up to 15. Yes, I'm sure many people <laughs> agree with you, many vendors. It is a. Um, an area that the controller's office has taken up and they have had at least for a couple of years uh, different groups that have been coming together to try to get at some of these problems and that one isn't resolved yet but they it's definitely on the agenda and there's people meeting to discuss and see what the alternatives would be one thing just as a side note is that um, the fringe benefit rate, we have a kind of a, it's a, it's a, it's a I'll just say it's 25%, except it's not capped. So we don't say you cannot go above that. That's just like a baseline. And then if, if that is too low and it needs to be 30, you just need to come back and explain how, like where you're taking the money. So there are some things that are built in. The other thing that the, city is implementing is trying to build in a cost of doing business into the um, into the contract year if, like to to project let's I'm making up this amount but let's say it's three percent but when the mayor's office gives us our city budget put the three percent in as inflationary cost mm -hmm. maybe on the other side when we have to balance our budget we don't we have to come up with solutions to address that or not to address it to accommodate that but they're making it they want to uh, they want us to be able to build it in and for the vendors the CBOs to have more assurance about future funding because what happens is Right, it goes through the mayor, the budget process, the board, and yay, June 30th, you get 3% for this year. So it's late, yeah. especially if you're doing negotiations. So that's another thing that's going to be a change into the um, city contracting, where we do 5% five, five year terms, but we'll be adding a piece, oh. you know, and then if funding's available. So there's things around the edges that are being done, but I, I hear you. and. 
it's definitely a topic that's being worked on. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. For, I appreciate that information. Yeah. All right. Uh, may we go to public comment? And there is no one on the line, so uh, a consideration for adjournment whenever you two are feeling ready. Well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I will move to adjourn then. <laughs> okay, I will second. And uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you very much. Uh, we are adjourned. Uh, thank you. Thank you.